Hi, and uh, welcome to this next video uh, where we talk about the perceptron learning algorithm as the first example of a uh, machine learning algorithm for supervised learning. Okay, so, um, right, so it's the first example of an algorithm that we'll see. And let us just remind ourselves what is supervised learning, right? So, from the previous video, we saw that uh, there are a couple of ingredients that go into a supervised learning setup, right? So, there's an unknown target function f that assigns labels to feature vectors. Right? So feature vectors are d-dimensional vectors and each of them have a label and there's some unknown function that maps the feature vectors to labels. So for instance, the feature vector could again contain all the pixels of an image and the label could be whether it's a cat or a dog. Right? And then what we get is a bunch of training examples, x1 to xn. Uh, so these are feature vectors, these x1 to xn, together with uh, the corresponding label of the evaluation of this unknown target function on the corresponding feature vector. All these training examples then feed into a learning algorithm that is supposed to search through a hypothesis set and output a hypothesis that hopefully resembles uh, the unknown target function. So that was the basic idea in, in supervised learning. So let's have a look, closer look. So to motivate the perceptron learning algorithm, the first example of a learning algorithm we'll see, uh, let's look at a concrete example of um, mortgage approval, right? So let's say you want to buy a house and uh, the bank or real estate agency need to determine whether you can uh, lend the money to, to buy the house. So there are a couple of features that go into such a decision, right? For instance, your salary is probably important for whether you're allowed to, to buy a house. And also how much debt do you have and how expensive is the house, right? These are reasonable features that go into such a decision. Now, the labels that we want to predict is whether we should approve the application or decline the application. Good, so, so what we want to do now, let's say one, one thing we could try to do is to say we have some historic data that we've already collected where professionals have sat down and approved the declined mortgage applications, right? So we know which of these previous applications were approved and which ones were declined. And let's say we just want to train a machine learning model just to mimic the behavior of these professionals, right? So I'm not just saying that we want to do better than the professionals, we just want to say we want to produce the same behavior, the same decisions as these professionals would have done. And to do that, we'll use training data, uh, this historic, data of applications and, and the outcomes to try and find an algorithm or a hypothesis that can kind of automate this uh, procedure of whether to approve or decline an, an application, right? So, and we want this automated process to do the same as the experts would have done. Okay, so, so just to uh, kind of give an intuition or make it easier to, to see, let us just assume that only two features because then it's easier to draw the data in, in 2D. Okay, so, so let's see. So let's say that the, the features that go into this decision are uh, uh, the salary of the person that wants to buy the house and also the price of the house. Good. So, so maybe the historic data looks something like this, right? So you have a bunch of each of these points, either a triangle or a circle, represent a previous uh, application for a, a mortgage. And some of them were approved and some of them were declined. As you can see here, it seems that you know if you have a high salary and the price of the house is low, then you typically approve the application. And on the other hand, if it's an expensive house but your salary is low, then probably uh, the application will be declined. Okay, so this is kind of this. This seems like a pretty reasonable uh, plot of of what such data could look like. And then, the, of course, what we want to do is that we want to use this trained data to figure out. Uh, whether we should approve or decline this new application here, right? So when someone comes and, and applies uh, for a mortgage, but right, you know the salary, you know the price of the house, but we have to make up the decision, right? So if we approve it or decline it. And we want to do something that's consistent with the historic data. And of course, in, in this example, right, it could seem like um, if we draw this line, right, we can actually separate, the previous data can kind of be separated by, by a line so that everything above the line corresponds to declined applications and everything below the line corresponds to approved applications. Okay, so uh, so maybe we can train what we call a linear model, right? So try to find this line that can be used to separate the data into a approved and declined. Now, the question is, of course, how do we find this line? Okay, so, so really, if we actually had this line, right, then basically the, the prediction we would make is just, you know, draw the line, everything above, this entire region up here 
there we would decline the application and everything below we would approve the application. Okay, so a linear model in general, such how do you specify such a line? Such a linear model can be specified by uh, three parameters. So we think of the hypothesis, like, namely this line as being specified by three parameters, a W1, a W2, and a B. And then we have um, data features, X1 and X2, right? So we have two features in this example, right? The, the salary and the price of the house. And the decision that we make in such a linear model, this line can be described basically by asking whether this linear combination, we will take the first weight here, W1, multiply onto the first data feature, plus the second weight on, multiply onto the second feature is greater than this B. So we call this B the bias, okay? So, so basically with a linear model makes a decision like this, right? So you compute a linear combination of the data features using the weights up here in the hypothesis, and you check whether this linear combination evaluates something that's greater than or smaller than a fixed bias B. And all these three things, W1, W2, and B, are the parameters of the model. This is what the learning algorithm is allowed to choose from. Okay, so uh, let's try to have a closer look at this. Right. So this B is the bias, and these are the weights on the different data features. Okay, so if we go back to this picture of supervised learning, then uh, the hypothesis set down here could be in this example of linear models, could let the hypothesis set H be all the possible linear models, right? So every single model you can write in this way where you have D different weights, one corresponding to each of the input features, and then you have a bias at the end. And the model would simply return whether this linear combination W1 times the first feature plus W2 times the second feature and so on evaluates to at least B. Right. So this is the this is all models of this form would go into the hypothesis set. And then the learning algorithm is allowed to choose any one of those, right? It will try to look for, in this case, a line or a hyperplane in higher dimensions, such that you know, using this everything above or below this line to determine the the label of, a, of an input a, a training example or of a feature vector that will make it give good predictions. So, so let's try to go back again, right? So uh, in often it's often the case that when we look at binary classification, meaning there's only two labels. So for instance, thinking again of the cats and the dogs, we would normally associate these two different labels uh, with the numbers minus one and one, right? So for instance, we could let cat be mapped to minus one and dog be mapped to one. Okay, so again, so, so all of these algorithms that we'll see for linear models, we typically think of the labels as minus one and one. Okay, and the features are again, x1 to xd, the labels are minus one, one. The parameters of a linear model, so this is again, this is what the algorithm, the learning algorithm gets to choose, is a weight for each of the features and a bias B. Now, the decision that we make is the following, right? So if this linear combination is at least minus the bias, because we just moved the bias to the other side, then we're going to approve, and otherwise we're going to decline, right? So we just compute a linear combination, check whether it's at least minus the bias, and if it is, then uh, we return, I guess, um, you could say um, one, uh, otherwise we turn minus one, right? So, right, so uh, blue here is just the, the class one, and Red is the class minus one, as we've indicated here at the top. And sometimes this is can be written a little bit more succinctly as saying the hypothesis, if we have a hypothesis W, then the prediction that we make on X is just taking the sign of this expression, right? So we're computing the linear combination W1, X1 plus W2, X2 plus all the way up to W2, D, X, D. We're adding the bias. And then we're taking the sign of this, right? So if it's positive, we're going to return one. And if it's negative, we're going to return uh, minus one. You can see that this is the same as this decision up here, right? Because if we move the minus B to the other side, we get exactly this whole sum inside the inside the sign, right? And the test up here is saying, is this sum greater than zero? Then we return the class one, which is the same down here, right? If you take the sign of something positive, you get one. On the other hand, if you take the sign of something negative, we get minus one. And generally, if we get exactly zero, we will think of this as maybe an error that we're not getting any of the classes, right? So sine of zero, we would think of that as zero. Okay, so, so really, we will often think of it this way, right? That given such a linear model of parameters W1 to WD and a bias B, 
the way we evaluate it on a given feature vector is if we compute this linear combination w1 x1 plus w2 x2 all the way up to wd xd and then we add the bias and we check whether this is a positive or a negative number and we use this to to uh, to get the sign right and this can actually be seen if we if we go back to this picture we had before then uh, this has a natural interpretation here. If we, if we look at it, then the W, the parameters of the W, these W1 and W2 in this case, they basically give what's called an often normal vector of the normal vector of this hyperplane. But it's, it's not normalized to have unit norm. If you've seen such things before, they might be normalized to have unit norm. In general, this W1 and W2, they just give a vector whose direction is orthogonal to the hyperplane. Okay, so it points orthogonally onto the hyperplane that we're at. And so that's what W is. And um, I guess the bias, let's have it here, right? If we have a bias, the bias is really the offset or the shift of this hyperplane away from the origin in the direction that uh, W points in. And so that's kind of like a visual illustration of these parameters. Uh, what do they become? So maybe we can just check this small example here, right? So let's say we want to make a prediction over here at this point that is at 8, 3. So the x-coordinate is 8, the y-coordinate is 3. Let's say this vector w here, uh, the direction of it is 0 0.7. So it got 0 0.7 out and minus 1 down on the, on the y-axis, right? So this is the vector w. And maybe say the bias here is uh, minus 0 0.3. Okay, so the basically this this hyperplane has been shifted it needs to be shifted minus zero point three to get back to the origin minus zero point three in the direction of W. So this is like a pictorial way of of showing this uh, this hyperplane specified by this vector W and this bias uh, B. And we can see that if we want to evaluate this right. Uh, call again from the previous slide. Right, we need to take the sign of where we have to take the inner product between this vector w to so take the first corner of w 0 0.7 multiply on to the eight so that's the term we have here and we have to add the minus one multiplied on to the three it gives us a minus three here and then we have to include the bias which is a minus 0 0.3 so 5.6 minus three minus 0 0.3 this is a positive number so we have to predict one right the positive class which is consistent with what we've seen here on, on the picture, right? We're in the, the blue region below the hyperplane. In general, right, you'll see that if you plug in any point that lies below this hyperplane, this expression, the sign of this will uh, evaluate to one. And if you plug in anything that lies above, uh, the sign of this expression will evaluate to, uh, to minus one. Okay. So this is in general how you can actually go back and forth between, I guess, specifying these hyperplanes as uh, vectors and a bias and then just drawing them pictorially like this. Okay. So, so in general, right, we have such a line is specified by a W and a B. So that's the linear model, right? And the prediction we make, so the parameters of the linear model is the all these D weights and the bias. And the prediction we make is just the sign of uh, this linear combination plus the bias. Okay. Good. So again, right, if we look at this picture, uh, in our example, we'll, one example of a hypothesis set that you could use would be the set of all linear models, right? So every possible way of choosing D weights and a bias. And the prediction that we make on such a set of parameters is just the sign of this expression here, like the, the, uh, the W1, X1 plus W2, X2, all the way up to WD, XD plus the bias. We take the sign of this and that's the prediction. Okay, so right, so what's left to try and specify is now to how, how we find an algorithm A now that given some training examples can quickly find a hypothesis in this hypothesis set, so a linear model, so basically it has to search for these parameters W1 to WD and the bias B, and such that we make good predictions, meaning that this hypothesis that we output, this W of X, G in this notation here will uh, approximate the unknown target function. Okay, so good. So how do we do that? And this is what the perceptron learning algorithm does, the first example of a learning algorithm that we'll see. The perceptron learning algorithm is an algorithm uh, for finding a good set of parameters W1 to WD and a bias B. Okay. <clears throat> 
which and here good means that it's going to classify I say all the train data correctly or most of the train data correctly at least right so that's the goal here we want to we want to find a hypothesis that does well on this known training data the data that we have available right and then if you remember from the last video the hope is in general that if we can find a hypothesis that performs well on the training data then this hypothesis should also perform well on new data, at least if new data is similar to, to the training data, right? And this was something that we'll get back to later on. But the general idea is that we wanna find a hypothesis now, a linear model, a line that predicts the labels correctly for most of the training data. And this is what the perceptual learning algorithm does, right? Just to simplify things a little bit more, there's a common trick that we'll see here and we'll see it again in future videos. And that is a way of getting rid of this special bias parameter, right? In some sense, when we look at this up here, right, this bias parameter is kind of treated a little bit special, right? It's not multiplied onto any of the data features, um, whereas all the other weights are. So it's a little bit annoying to have to deal with this bias. And this is a standard trick for getting rid of it. And let's just uh, introduce it now. So the basic trick is to say, if I have a data set with D features, then I just add one extra coordinate to it. Right? So I just prepend the coordinate. And for every single data item, I'm just gonna hard code this feature to equal one. Okay, so I just do that when I collect a lot of data, I just hard code an extra feature in the beginning that's always hard coded to one. And I also do this importantly, when I get a new data item where I have to make a prediction on, I hard code an extra feature in the beginning, that's just one, right? And now, we think of the parameters of a hypothesis W as being D plus one numbers, and we just call them W zero to W D. And now we actually do a linear combination. There's no special bias. We just take W zero times the first coordinate of a data point. And recall that we just hard coded the first coordinate. We added a special coordinate that's always one. Right? So we get W zero times one. And then the rest of the linear combination is W one X one at W two X two up to W D X D. And this is just, there's, I guess, the zero of coordinate, the one that's indexed by zero of the data uh, element. So in some sense, right, we can just get rid of the bias by a sort of increasing the dimensionality of the data set. So we had before, if we had a one dimensional data set, we can just add an extra coordinate that we hard code to one. So we kind of lift all the data uh, along another axis. So, so that's just a trick we can introduce. And now there's no special bias, the bias is just hard coded into the first parameter of, uh, of the vector weights. Okay, so now these are the models that we're kind of searching for, W0 to WD, and the prediction we're going to make is W0, X0 plus W1, X1, all the way up to WD, XD, just knowing that all the data that we're ever going to look at, both the training data and new data, we will always hard code this X0 to be a one, and that's the, that's the idea. Okay, so we can kind of get rid of this uh, first coordinate by always hard coding at the first coordinate to be one, and then we have the, the actual features afterwards, right? And then the model parameters of the linear model is just a W0 to a WD, where the W0 captures the bias, okay? And the prediction again is just the sign of this linear combination. And uh, I guess you, now it also has a simple notation, right? This is just a sign of the inner product between W and X, right? This whole expression here is just the inner product between W and the feature vector X that we have up here. So that's all we're doing, right? We're just taking inner products between the feature vector and the data items, right? And the perception learning algorithm now is an algorithm for finding a good set of parameters W0 to WD. Okay, so just finding these coordinates of this W. Good. And good means, again, it classifies most of the trained data correctly. And hopefully this also means that when we get new data, it's also going to uh, make good predictions on the new data. And again, remember that if you get a new data items and you've done this trick with hard coding the first feature to one, you also have to do that uh, to the new data item, right? When you want to make a new prediction, add this hard coded feature. Good. So basically, Right, if W and X are column vectors, then this is just the inner product of the two vectors and we take the sign of the inner product. And that's all that's happening. Okay, so the perceptron learning algorithm. Right, so how can we search for, we're just given these points, right? They're just given as input or just a long list of points and the labels. And now we have to search for a, or find this line that separates the data into 
two classes, all the red points on one side and all the blue points on the other side. All the ones with label minus one on one side and the one with labels plus one on the other side. And how can we do this? And the algorithm is extremely simple, right? It's so it's really surprising that it works. So what it does is it just starts by initializing all the ways to zero, right? And then it has the following loop, right? So it looks at the data right? and it says, okay, is the data point X comma Y among the training data, right? So I know both the label and the feature vector such that if I make a prediction, I, I call again the sign of the inner product between W and X, that's the prediction we would make if we use the hypothesis W to make a prediction for the label of X. So we check uh, the prediction and we check, is this a wrong prediction, right? It's different than the label, right? And again here, since W is all zeros to begin with, zero in a product, anything is zero and the sign of zero we define to be zero. So it's always gonna be wrong the first time. Right, so we have a wrong classification of a data point. So we're just saying, while there is a data point that's wrongly classified, what we do is we take the vector W that we have so far, and then we're going to add something to it. And right? we're going to add the label Y times X to it. Okay, so we're gonna kind of change the vector of weights by adding y times x to it. And recall x comma y is a misclassified data point. Okay. And the intuition is that this operation here is going to make the vector w, or the hypothesis w, more correct on this example x comma y. And we'll see shortly why that's the case. And the algorithm just terminates once there are no misclassified data points. Okay. Right. At this time, it's not even clear that this will ever terminate, but we'll talk a bit more about that. So, so let's try to run an example here. So let's say we have this data here. And so far we've trained, we've been running it, the algorithm for a couple of iterations, and this is the current W, right? So it's pointing in some direction. And you know everything that has a positive inner product onto it is going to be classified as one. The sign of the inner product is going to be one down here in the blue region. The sign of the inner product is going to be minus one up here in the red region. Okay, so what we're doing is we're saying, okay, so the loop says, if there is a data point that is misclassified by the current hypothesis, uh, we do have such a point, right? This red one over here, this one is misclassified, right? Because its label is going to be predicted as one, but its true label is minus one. So there is a misclassified point. So what we should do according to this algorithm is that we should update the current W by adding Y times X to it. So, right, so what is X in this case, right? X is the feature vector. So that's the vector that points out to this, uh, this triangle here. So that's X. What's the label, right? The label is minus one. So we have to do minus X. We have to update W by adding minus X to it, right? So we add minus X to our W, moving the W vector over here instead. And so this is the new W after one iteration of this loop, right? So we change W to this. And now we can see, okay, so what higher plane does this correspond to, right? So everything uh, that has a positive inner product onto this high, uh, this vector is going to be classified as plus one and everything that has a negative inner product is going to be classified as minus one. And this gives exactly the split here, everything that, um, so you can kind of look at it, everything that's on this half is the plus one and everything on this half is the minus one. Okay. And as you can see right now, it's actually got, it's correct on this red point here. So we managed to kind of move or change the hypothesis. So it now correctly predicts the label of, of this data point here. Okay, that's great. So, right, so what we said before was that this update here will make W more correct on the data point X comma Y, right? So let's just try and argue briefly, why is that the case, right? Why does it become more correct on X comma Y? Or what do we mean by it? Okay, so to do that, we could say, okay, um, let's use the notation W of T to be the vector W, right? The hypothesis W after T steps of the while loop. Okay. And so let's say that now that X of T and Y of T is the point X comma Y that we choose in step T, right? So that's the one that we found that is misclassified. Okay, so, so this was a misclassified point, a point that's misclassified by W of T. Right. Then if that was, if we define them like this, then we know that the next W that we have, the W for the next iteration is going to be, well, the previous W plus Y of T times X of T, right? That's exactly what this update is doing here. Now, we would like to argue that this W T plus one is more correct 
on the point x comma y. And why is that? So we can look at it here, right? So the prediction we would make will be the sign of the inner product between w t plus one and x t, right? So that's if we would try to predict the label of this point x of t using the new hypothesis, right? We would take the sign of this inner product. That's exactly the new prediction we would make. So let's just ignore the sign for now and see what does this inner product evaluate to. Okay, so we just plug in the definition of wt plus one, right? So this is wt plus yt xt. So we have this whole thing inner product xt. Right? So by linearity, we can move this x of t inside. So we can move it in onto the w of t. So what you notice here is that this here, this inner product that we have down here between w of t and x of t, that is the thing we took sign of before, right? That is before we updated w, this is the, the previous kind of prediction. Okay, so this is the previous prediction and now we add something to that prediction. What is that thing that we add, right? It's the label y of t, so the, the actual label of the point. And then it's the inner product between x and itself. Okay, so, right, so this is the value of the previous step. And what is the inner product between x and itself, right? So the inner product between a vector and itself is just the sum over all the coordinates of that coordinate squared. Right. And of course, the sum of squares is going to be greater than greater than or equal to zero, I guess, unless you know if, if x is a zero vector, you get zero, but otherwise you're going to get a positive number, right? Because if you square something, it's going to be positive. So, right, so this inner product between x and itself is always going to be a uh, non-negative number, a positive number, let's say, if x is not the zero vector. And what we do is that we add this y of t to it. Right. So we're going to take the label and uh, of this point, and then we're going to multiply it with a non-negative number, and we're going to add that to the current prediction, right? So this is actually going to make the prediction go more in the direction of the actual label, right? So, so this moves the prediction in the direction of the label, which means that eventually, if we keep doing this, it's going to be perfectly correct, right? Because it's going to flip to have the same sign, even if it was wrong before, right? Because we're kind of, we're adding something that has the same sign as the actual label we want to predict. Now, maybe notice here that the only thing that could go wrong is that this uh, vector X is actually the, the zero vector. And if you remember, right, we, we chose the way we, we started out, right? We had this special trick where all the vectors have this hard-coded first coordinate to be one, right? So, so indeed, like the very first coordinate adds a one square times a one here. So actually the sum is strictly greater than zero. So it's, it's actually going to be more correct, right? It cannot, we cannot have the zero vector in our input data because of this hard-coded bias. So it will always become more and more correct on this concrete example, X comma Y that we find, right? Now, okay, so it becomes more correct on the misclassified point that we found, basically because we move the inner product between W and this point X towards the label of the point, at least the same sign of the label. Now, but on the other hand, the downside is that, you know, it could actually be that the predictions become more wrong on other data points. Uh, so let's see an example of this. Right. So let's say we run the algorithm for a while, and this is the current situation here. Right. So this is the W, and right, there's still a misclassified point here, namely this, uh, this red point. So the loop would tell us to, uh, look at this point, take the vector that points in this direction, multiply it with the label of the point, which is minus one in this case, right? So red is minus one. And then we would update W by adding minus X over here, right? So we would move W to point in this direction. And now it would become this hyperplane here. Now for this hyperplane here, you can see now suddenly this, uh, this blue point out here is misclassified, right? Whereas before it was correctly classified and now it's misclassified. So, you know, so while it actually made the prediction correct on the red point, it introduced mistakes on other data points, right? So this can happen. Good. So, right, so you could of course ask yourself, is this algorithm ever going to do anything good, right? Might it just continue to flip back and forth and, you know, make some predictions more wrong, some of them more correct and, and never really terminate, right? Um, it can actually be proven that as long as the data is linearly separable, meaning that it's actually possible to draw a line with all the data on one side, uh, all the data of one class on one side and all the data of the other class on the other side, if such a line exists, 
then this algorithm is actually going to terminate uh, with the perfect classification of the training data. It's actually going to find a line that splits it. Yeah, so that can actually be proved. We will not do it here, but that can actually be, be proved. Right? It's not so trivial to prove. Otherwise, I guess we would have done it here, but it, it requires a bit of linear algebra and, and thinking here. But one can prove this. So that is actually a reasonably good algorithm for uh, data that can be linearly separated. And maybe just to make completely clear what it means to be linearly separable, right? So a data set here with two classes, in this case, the red and the blue point, is linearly separable if there exists a separating hyperplane. Okay, so a separating hyperplane is just a line in 2D, right? So if there exists something that actually classifies it correctly, then it's linearly separable. Right, so this is a linearly separable data set. Uh, this one is not here right, because you cannot really draw a line that perfectly separates the blue and the red points. So of course it makes sense that you know you're not going to this algorithm that keeps looking for a hypothesis that perfectly classifies the data before it, it terminates. It's not going to terminate if if such a line doesn't exist, right? So, so that makes sense. So this is not linearly separable, so it doesn't exist a separating hyperplane. Okay, All right. So this was the algorithm. And now I think it would make good sense just to try to see this algorithm run on some data. Right? So implemented in Python, and let me just try and uh, and show you an example of this thing running. So okay, so let's exit this slideshow here. Yeah. So right, so let's open this terminal here. And let's see the algorithm run here. Okay, so this just takes a little while to get started. But now th what this algorithm is going to do is it's going to it's going to generate some data and it's going to run this perceptron learning algorithm on that data set, right? And it, each time, it, so here we have the two classes. And then the, the black point here is kind of one data point that is misclassified by the current hyperplane, right? So that's the one it chooses in each step to update it. I'm going to run it again, just to make you see what happens. Again, we have these two classes of data, and then there's a dashed line that sometimes appears and sometimes disappears. This dashed line represents the current hyperplane. And when you, when you cannot see it, it's just because it's outside this region of the data points that, are, that you can see in the picture. And each time in each step, it's going to highlight one of the points with a black circle. One, it's a point that is currently misclassified. And that's the one that we use to update the hyperplane. Okay, and then you can see, and then it stops once it finds one that perfectly classifies the data. And indeed it did that here, right? It found this, this green hyperplane at the end. And over here on the right, you can kind of you can see a plot of the accuracy. So how large a fraction of the data points are correctly classified by the current hyperplane. As you can see, it actually does do this thing of actually going, actually suddenly it misclassifies more points than it correctly classified before, right? So it, so it can actually, its accuracy can actually decrease and increase, right? So it can go up and down when you go back and forth. Right? Because, because you make it more correct on one data point, you can still make it uh, less correct on a bunch of other data points. And sometimes this will actually reduce the accuracy. But it terminated with a perfect classification of the data. Let us just see it run once again. So over here you see, right? So there's a misclassified point, the hyperplane. Oh, there you can see a hyperplane. It sometimes the hyperplane is completely outside of the of the window, and it just keeps going back and forth, looking for a hyperplane that perfectly separates the data each time, picking the black point that's something that's misclassified by the current hyperplane and updating it until it finds one that perfectly classifies the training data. Okay. So that was an execution of this. So let me go back to the slideshow. So let us just share this thing here. Good. Good. So that's the perceptron learning algorithm. And the, the hypothesis that we get at the end is the one that we choose as our output. That's the algorithm hypothesis that our learning algorithm produces in supervised learning. And that's the one that we will use to classify new data if we get new data, right? So any future predictions are just going to be based on taking the sign of the inner product between this W and the new data, data element. And again, recall, we have to add this hard-coded uh, first quadrant that we hard-code to one if we did the bias trick. Good. So at least on this picture here, 
if it was linearly separable, we found this line, we would make a prediction of blue in this case, right? It's on the blue side of the hyperplane. Right? Because we just take the sign between the vector W that specifies this hyperplane and the X, which will give us the side of the hyperplane that uh, the green point lies on. And here we would, it would say blue. And here it would say red because it lies on the opposite side of the hyperplane. Okay. Now, of course, right, what we said is that the hope is that if we perfectly classify the training data, then we'll also perform well on new data. And just because we perfectly classify the training data doesn't necessarily mean that we will perfectly classify new data, right? Uh, but the hope is just that it helps, right? That, that at least if we're good on the training data, then we're also hopefully good on new data. And we'll return to this in, in depth later and, and try to argue when, this, when can you trust that this is the case. Right. So of course, right, you could actually have examples, like even though, you know, let's say this, this blue point here was not in the training data, you trained, you found this line, it perfectly separates the data set, right? It could actually be that any that there's a new data point that you would get and the correct label is actually blue, even though it sits on the top of the hyperplane, right? That's, you know, you don't know. You're just hoping that the hyperplane is a good predictor for the, for the label. Okay, now, uh, the previous example here, right, the, the algorithm assumed that the data is linearly separable, right, because it only terminates if the data is linearly separable. So, of course, we would like to do something useful, uh, even in the case where the data is not linearly separable, right? You, uh, you might often have that there's a little bit of noise, but maybe it's close to being linearly separable, but there's just a few outliers that, are on the, that cannot really be put on the right side of any hyperplane. So we would like to do something useful there. And there's a, a twist to this perceptron learning algorithm, which is called the pocket perceptron learning algorithm. And the main idea is very simple, right? Uh, you kind of use the same algorithm and then you just remember the best hyperplane you saw along the, the line and kind of think of it as keeping it in your pocket. So here's the extended version of the algorithm. Uh, you start again by initializing the weights arbitrarily, maybe to all zeros. And then you keep track of, the best one that you've seen, right? So the best score is like the, the highest accuracy that you've seen. And let's say in the beginning, this one has the accuracy of zero because it predicts zero for all the points and all the points have labels either one or minus one. And then you also just store what is the best hyperplane that we've seen. And now the loop, the algorithm just says, okay, while you have more times, this is something that you can specify as a user of the algorithm, right? You can say, maybe I only want to run for 10,000 iterations or maybe five seconds or whatever. So you say, while I have more time, I find a point that is misclassified, right? So X comma Y is a point that is misclassified by the current hyperplane W. What you do is if you found such a misclassified point, then you do the same update step as before, right? You change the, uh, the, the hypothesis, the weights by adding this Y, so the label of the misclassified point times X, right? And this is what we argued before makes the hypothesis more correct on this point X comma Y, but it could become less correct on other data points. So you make this update and then you compute the quality of the current or this new hyperplane that you got, right? So basically you compute a score, which is what percentage of data do I correctly classify with this new W? Then I compare this score to the best one I've seen so far. And if it's better, so it classifies more things correctly, I will say that, oh, this is the best one I've seen so far, this new W, and this is the best score that I've seen so far. And when I'm out of time, I just return the best one I found. Right. So it's a very natural extension of the previous algorithm. All right. So let's try to see that one run as well. So let me try and do a share of this thing. So let me try to do a new execution, but this time on a harder data set. A data set that uh, does not have such a, a separating hyperplane. So let's just wait for it to start. It's the same kind of plot, so it will look similar to what you've seen before, right? Each time highlighting the, the current hyperplane and also plotting the accuracy on one side and showing what, what is the point that we changed. So, okay, so here's the data set, and each time it, it uses different lines, the black circle shows with what is the point that it's currently examining something that is misclassified. So as the algorithm runs, it always finds these misclassified points, add them to the, the parameters of the current hyperplane, and it just keeps going. As you can see, the accuracy goes up and down uh, and it behaves, sometimes it goes way wrong and sometimes it behaves very well. So the algorithm just keeps running as long as you have time. And 
uh, with the algorithm here will stop very soon. So it just keeps, okay, so now it stopped and you can see like the, the black dashed line is the one that it, it you looked at in the last iteration and the green one here is the best one it saw at any given time of the execution, right? So if you go over here on the right, the green one would correspond to the one you have in, in this iteration here. Right, so it just keeps looping and returns the best one that it's seen throughout the execution of the algorithm. Okay, and that's this one here. Okay, so that's the pocket version of the algorithm. Okay, good. So let me just start it again, the slides here. So, good. So, now it's running, good. So that was an execution of this pocket version of the algorithm. And so let's just conclude by, by kind of summarizing what we saw, right? So we kind of, at least in the previous video, we tried to motivate what is machine learning. And we saw a couple of different variants, right? There was the supervised machine learning, the unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. So there were three different types. And then we kind of started going in depth with supervised learning and saw this one example here of the perceptron learning algorithm. And in supervised learning, right, the general setup was this. Right, there's some unknown target function that maps feature vectors to labels. And we've also, we receive as input, we receive a bunch of training examples and training examples consisting of feature vectors and the corresponding labels, meaning the evaluation of this unknown target function on these feature vectors. This feeds into a learning algorithm that then searches somehow through a hypothesis set to find a hypothesis G that looks a lot like the unknown target function, right? So the way this is done is basically you try to get good performance on the training data. So that's the a kind of optimization step where the learning algorithm is searching for uh, a hypothesis that does well on the training data. Like the perceptron learning algorithm, right? That kind of searches through a bunch of uh, hyperplanes until it finds ones that, that performs well on the training data. And the key thing here is that in supervised learning, right, the learning algorithm, it knows the labels of the training data. So it can use that uh, to, to see whether it has good performance on the training data. And then the general hope is just that if you have good performance on the training data, then this leads to good performance on new data. And this is what's called generalization that we will return to later on. And of course, on new data, you don't know the labels, you only know the feature vectors, right? So you have to make predictions without knowing the labels. Right. And finally, we saw the first example of a learning algorithm, namely this perceptron learning algorithm. 